the common modalities of governance for managing resources and So you're Pat Mooney and you're from the ETC group and ETC means for erosion, technology and um, concentration. And yeah. Can you explain the, the three words of the ETC group and GEO? Yeah, I mean, we actually call ourselves etc. because uh, uh, we seem to deal with the things that are left over. <laughs> People talk about we do this and this, etc. but we're, we're the etc. We do the leftovers. But um, we actually meant it to, to talk about erosion technology and concentration. And it comes really from, from a, a meeting that I attended, uh, I was invited to speak at, of a global business council in New York in the late 1980s. And I was invited to, to speak at the UN to this business group that was meeting inside the United Nations. And they, were, they had the, the uh, George Bushes, the first George Bushes uh, uh, science advisor. Uh, White House science specialists uh, speaking before I spoke and he talked about how global warming was a reality this is like 1988 global warming was a reality they had to do something about it uh, the environment was deteriorating rapidly and the solution was technology and the only way that they could solve the problems with technology was if they had the full collaboration of industry so he wanted industry to understand that when the Rio Earth Summit took place in 1992, four years away at that point, it would be uh, with industry support, they developed the new technologies to solve the climate and other environmental problems. And in my mind, it was almost, it, the equation became clear. What we have is a collapsing environment uh, in every respect. It's ecologically collapsing, it's, uh, the stratosphere is in trouble, the, the soils are eroding, the, the seeds are disappearing, the, the livestock are disappearing. Um, there's no aspect of our, of our living environment that isn't being destroyed. But also, our cultural environment is also being destroyed. We lose two languages, you know, every, or language every, every fortnight. We lose uh, uh, ways of understanding the world all the time. And so that cultural erosion is also there, uh, and our rights are being eroded. So for us, and we see that, of course, all the time, but it's, um, to us then, it's, it's not just an environmental erosion, it's also uh, a cultural erosion, also an erosion of, of our rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And then that's, well, that's happening, that collapse is taking place. Uh, we're being told that, again, the solution to all of that is to put our faith in science and technology, to, to trust technology, to, to, to develop those things which will get us through these crises. And the only people that will get us through those crises, that can develop those technologies, is the private sector. Yeah. But the private yeah. sector won't do it unless it has the collaboration of governments. And governments have got to guarantee their investments, has got to protect them from the risk involved in new technologies, and government has got to allow them to have the monopoly control and the cartels they need to have to be able to control the technologies. So that's the concentration side. It's, it's the collusion between governments and, and corporations as well. And there is also concentration of the, the big companies, the oligopoles, Absolutely. that uh, use, you use the term sugar capitalism or biomasters. Yeah, very much. It, it is in that sector of the economy it relates to, to the living materials of the planet, the living earth. Uh, we see that, that the companies look at that as a wonderful opportunity. I mean, as they see it, uh, to be precise, they say 23.8% of the world's uh, annual terrestrial biomass has been commodified, is in the, in the, in the capitalist marketplace. But that means for them that 76.2% of the world's annual terrestrial biomass has yet to be commodified. It's there to be monopolized by whoever gets there first. So the, the, the holy grail for them, for the new biomasters, is to get control of that three quarters of, of life that, that they don't yet own. That's quite scary, I think. Well, in fact, uh, ETC Group is well known for uh, world matters. Uh, you, you invent uh, many words, just like Terminator, it's, it's you, uh, Pat, who invented the term to talk about GERT, genetic use restriction technology that kills the seeds before it grows. Um, you use the term, uh, the Captain Hook Awards oh, yeah. to talk about biopiracy. 
and we you, also came with biopiracy. That was one of our favorites. Yeah, and and you use a band technology to to design beat atom neuron and gene to show how it's a big band from all technology and all that terms are, are very precise uh, because they convey uh, a new meaning for, for people directly, for the media directly. And you always work very well, this aspect of, the, of your critic. Well, I hope so. I, I'm not sure it always works across different languages and cultures, but uh, uh, tragically, I guess, uh, English dominates in, in, the, in the international media so much that I guess some of the language works its way through. But we always get lectures. I remember when we first called uh, the suicide seed Terminator, um, we, uh, uh, I had friends uh, from Spain and other places tell me, well, oh no, you can't use a word like that. Now we're going to have to explain that to everybody. No one will understand Terminator. And of course, everybody understood. And, yeah. But of course, we got the idea from Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, so it was him. That he, t he showed us what Terminator could do, and we thought, well, that applied. But it, it was kind of interesting because we first found the, the, the Terminator patent, as we called it, uh, in March of, of, uh, of uh, 1998. And we issued a news release the day the patent was issued, saying this is really, really dangerous. The world has got to stop this kind of technology from going forward. No one paid any attention at all. There was absolutely silence. Uh, no one picked up the news story. So literally, I think it was two weeks later, we were desperate and we thought, we've got to get people to pay attention. And I said, well, let's, why don't we call it Terminator? <laughs> and, and the next day, we had New York Times calling us. <laughs> Terminator <laughs> and, technology. And that worked. Yeah, that worked. So. The world is very important. Yeah. And, and also, uh, your work is to produce some reports about what's happening. And you write your reports collectively, and you, you use a very scientific way to write the reports, to have citation, to, to look at the, the science publication, and also the industry publication. Yeah. And I, I suppose that's very important for you to talk to the media, to be credible. It's important to us to be credible, and, and it's absolutely vital for our, our partners to, to be able to trust us. Uh, we're very small, we're nine people. And, and it's critical that, that those that we work with, that we depend upon uh, to, to take the information and to interpret it themselves and use it and so on, they've got to trust that we know what we're talking about. Uh, and, and so for, for their sake and for our credibility, we, we have to get it right. And, and so we have to spend the time to do the research, we have to talk to the scientists, to the companies themselves, to the government officials themselves, to make sure that, that we can back up what we're saying. And I, I'm really proud that, that since I think the last time we had anybody challenge us on, on any of our figures was back in the early 1980s when we first talked about how the um, pesticide companies were buying seed companies to, to uh, create a technology that, where the seed would depend upon the pesticides. And remember then we had all kinds of scientists attacking us for that. And we couldn't prove it. And we said that. We just, we just knew we were right. We just knew that was what the market, that was the logic of the marketplace would be to create that technology. And um, we were right, of course, in the end, that was what biotechnology did. It developed herbicide-tolerant plant varieties. Uh, but we, we learned from that experience that we really had to back up what we had to say. You have to have solid ground yeah. uh, to build all your ideas. And I suppose that uh, you think as, that's a model for all social movement for now, to, to have solid ground to, to explain, really, what's happening all around, not only ideology. Yeah, but we get, we get solid ground from one another. Like We get solid ground from La Via Campesina when, when they tell us what's happening to the climate because they see it on the ground from their farm. We get solid ground from, from trade unions that, that uh, are experiencing the problems of nanotechnology in the research labs. So, so it's both ways. You know, we give them some information they can use. They give us a basis to understand that information as well. So, but but I, I want to... Something else that you'd said, which I think is very important, which is that, that as a group, there's nine of us. Uh, we're scattered from the Philippines to Mexico to Canada and the United States, and we always travel. But we, we, uh, we really do write together. It's, uh, someone may take the lead, but it's a collective exercise. So, so let, let's go back to the erosion problem. Sure. Um, you, don't you think that for now, uh, everybody tried to have a, an equivalent of everything, which is carbon? Yeah. And so uh, the climate change, the global climate change, uh, only lead to the carbon market. Isn't the, the new green economy a kind of speculative bubble? Yeah, yeah, it is. 
I mean, we all want a green economy. We yeah, all want that. Sure. But it's being defined. Is it this? No, it's being defined by BP and Exxon and DuPont and Monsanto and BASF, and we don't want that. And and it's it's a it's a greenwash again of of uh, of the reality of, of of the world. It's it's uh, it's pretending that. Uh, the Earth can, can produce anything it wants to, at any quantity it wants to, and they can use technologies to, to adjust the planet to, the, to those needs, and, uh, which is just nonsense. It's simply not true. Uh, it, it, it's astonishing to me that somehow we can be in a world where these companies have consistently failed in what they tell us will happen with new technologies. Mm -hmm. And now, with, with this green economy, they're saying, yes, we know that at the moment the technologies will not make this possible. We know that. They say that. They say maybe even the next generation won't maybe work so well. But after that, there's a third generation of, of, of biomass technologies that will take care of everything. So trust us, we'll get there. In the meantime, we have a billion hungry people. We have a crisis in the planet in every respect. We're supposed to have some faith that, that you know, somewhere down the road that they'll get it right. They've never got it right before. It's just insane. Well, in fact, it's... Uh economy of promises and it's science of promises. It works very well, yeah. It, it, it seems to... It's, it's Propaganda. Yeah, it's entirely that. Mm. And, the, and the geoengineering propaganda is, is the, the most dangerous one, frankly. It's this, this idea, and it, it can sound, again, so reasonable because, after all, can you geoengineer the planet into something else? <laughs> Absolutely, you can. That's how we got into this crisis. The industry geoengineered the planet through the Industrial Revolution and success of the Industrial Revolution. Climate change. Yeah. So they're right. It can be done. Can they do it right? No. Can, can, can the industries and the governments that have denied climate change, who have lied about climate change, who, who have not had the courage to do anything about climate change, who don't even have the guts to tell their own people to take the bus, can they be trusted to control a planetary thermostat on behalf of everybody? Absolutely not. And geoengineering, it's, it's a very important scientific scheme, a non-scientific scheme in the scientific universe, and which says that the planet is not a partner for now, it's just a machine. Yeah. And we have to regulate the machine. Yeah, and, and we know so little about that machine. It's, yeah. it's astonishing. Every year we are, we're shocked by what we didn't know about the planet. We learn new things about ocean currents, new things about glaciers, new things about inter interactions of wind and, and soils and so on. And yet we still think that we, we should be allowed the hubris to say that we can, uh, we can adjust the thermostat. We can, we can tinker with the, uh, the currents of the water or the air and, 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 and somehow save the rich at least. Yeah, and um, for now, science try to understand nature, and now we have people who want to say, "Oh, nature have to be just like our model is." Yeah. And don't you think it's a very dramatic change for science? I think we've been moving in that direction all along. Is to, if you go back even to to the beginnings of the industrial revolution or early on in there, there was still that attitude. There was still man, males harnessing nature, males bending nature to, to, uh, to our needs. So I don't know that it's changed so much. Just the scale has got enormous, and, and the, the gamble has got to the point. I mean, we're gambling with Gaia. We're gambling with, with the fate of the, of the, of the planet, and, and that's terrible. And we're gambling with the fates of the world's most marginalized peoples as well. But the planet is the only common we have. It's the last, it's the last frontier for us. It's, it's, frontier. Uh, it's an attack on, our, uh, on the seas, it's an attack on the sky, it's an attack on the soils. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, the ultimate control over, over uh, the planet. Thank you, Pat. Thank you.